A few programs back, we asked the provocative question, what would the disciples and apostles think if they came to your church on Sunday? Would they feel comfortable by what is taught and practiced, or would the entire service be very foreign to them? In today's Discover the Truth, we'll continue this examination of what the early church was like. Prepare for some shocking surprises. From the time of the Messiah to our modern technological age, much Bible truth has been lost. With the melding of foreign philosophies and teachings unknown to the believers of the first century, the early church began a transformation away from its Hebrew origins. The question we need to ask ourselves is, just how far did it go? Join us for the next half hour as we take you on an incredible journey of biblical understanding as we uncover the foundation of the Christian faith. Are you ready to discover the truth? Today we want to ask the question, basic and simple, is your church just like the one in the book of Acts in the New Testament? Do you hear and practice the same teachings? Are you finding discrepancies, missing links, missing teachings when you compare what you practice in your church with what you read in the New Testament? The news recently reported on an archaeological dig in the country of Jordan, discovering what the experts are saying was the very first Christian church ever. The Jordan Times reported what they claim is the world's first church dating back almost 2,000 years. Historical sources suggest that they both lived and practiced religious ritual in the underground church that they found and only left it after Christianity was embraced by Roman rulers. We do know from the New Testament that the early believers met and worshiped in homes. However, this is where history gets very fuzzy because how do the experts define Christians? It is incredible the matter of factness with which people can look at the New Testament and its setting and flowing smoothly as velvet from their lips are terms like Christian, first Christians, early or primitive Christianity. Sometimes you hear the statement, the first Christians were Jews. Now there's a tricky statement. They were all Jews, for sure, but were they also Christians at the same time? What exactly were the early New Testament believers? Were they Protestants, Catholics, Evangelicals? Strangely enough, they didn't even go by a name. That's right, they didn't have a name for themselves. Christianity derives its name, of course, in reference to the Messiah. When were they first called that, however? That's the question we'd like to pursue today. Was it when Yahshua the Messiah said, follow me? Did they take on the designation at Jerusalem on Pentecost, perhaps? If you turn to Acts chapter 11 and verse 26, you'll read about Barnabas searching for the apostle Paul. And then it says, when he found him, he brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the assembly and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. So here's what we notice about this passage. It says, number one, they were called, not that they called themselves this, but this is what others called them. The term Christian occurs only three times in the New Testament, tacked on by the Gentiles, one of which was Herod Agrippa. Now, wouldn't you think that this term would be all over the New Testament scriptures, supposedly being the very handbook for this new religion? You know, if I were to publish a book on computers, for instance, I'll warrant you that the term computer would appear all over the pages of my publication. Very well referenced because, after all, it's about computers. This absence of a name or even a well-defined description is one of the first among many strange anomalies we see with this new faith called Christianity, and it speaks volumes to the true seeker. 
The designation they gave themselves was the way or people of that way. Very general, not a specific term. This self-designation may be based on Yahshua's statement about his being the way in John chapter 14. The effect of the movement, for perhaps, like the way of salvation in, in Acts chapter 16. Or simply a reference to the correct way of Almighty Yahweh in Acts chapter 18. Well, hang on now, because the biggest shock of all is that the New Testament religion known as Christianity didn't begin with its supposed founder. Strange, but very true. Yahshua the Messiah was a Jew. He was born a Jew, he lived as a Jew, and he died a Jew. He lived a different religion from the one he is supposed to have started. Talk about getting off on a different foot. Christianity doesn't have much of a historical leg to stand on anyway. But the intrigue doesn't stop there. Years ago, I was asked to prove that Yahshua, the Messiah, the Savior, was a Jew, a Hebrew Israelite. This person was of a, per, a certain persuasion that he didn't want to accept the simple fact that his Savior's lineage traced directly to the tribe of Judah, which is where we get the word Jew. Well, first, Matthew's genealogy in chapter 1, verse uh, 3, begins with Judah and ends in verse 16 with Miriam, the Jewish mother of Yahshua the Messiah. Next, we can look at Luke chapter 1, verse 32, which corroborates 2 Samuel 7, 12, referring to David as Yahshua's earthly forefather. Then we can look at Acts, I'm sorry, at Hebrews chapter 7, verse 14, where it says he came from Judah. Very specific and very plain statement that our Savior rose out of the tribe of Judah. Hebrews 7.14 reads, For it is evident that our master sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning the priesthood. We can also look in the book of John, chapter 4 and verse 9, where a Samaritan woman clearly called the Savior a Jew. Pilate, the ruler, even called him the king of the Jews in John chapter 19, verse 19 and 21. The evangels present Yahshua, who incidentally had a Hebrew name, not a Greek one, just another witness against a Gentile-based religion. They present him as a Jew. He lived in the Jewish context and rarely came in contact with non-Jews. He is shown sometimes in conflict and at other times in consensus with other Jewish groups, but we never see him interacting with or attending a Christian worship, mainly because there was no such thing as Christian worship in his day, and there would not be until hundreds of years later. Everything he confronted as he traveled in and around Jerusalem was either Judaism or paganism. Christianity, as any kind of movement per se, was non-existent. Even the writers who, who later documented Yahshua's teachings to give us the New Testament were Jews, Hebrews. Not one of them converted to a Christian practice or taught such teachings of Christianity themselves. Not Matthew, not Mark, not Luke, not John, not Peter or Paul. Well, you may be surprised by today's message, but we have some more surprises for you. We have a booklet just published uh, re republished and redesigned called, called Astonishing Bible Truths That Your Church Never Taught. We think you'll be fascinated by this booklet. It's free of charge. It'll go through some of the things that you may have taken for granted in your worship that simply are not found in the scriptures. And we have some more information for you, and we'll be right back. Well, it was really nice talking to you. I have to go. God bless. Uh, wait, before you go, did you know that God is not the name of the Heavenly Father? But my Bible says that God is His name. If it's not God, then what is it? It's Yahweh. Yahweh. I've never even heard of that name before. My no. Bible doesn't say the name Yahweh. It says God. It's, uh, it's Hebrew. It was in the original scriptures, but later it was substituted. Hebrew? But I speak English. I have just a thing for you. 
but I speak English. The title God is so common to most that it doesn't even dawn on them that God is not a name. The title God in our English language can be used for any deity, past or present. Even Satan is referred to as the God of this world in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Most are unaware that when they say hallelujah, they are actually saying in Hebrew, praise Yah, Yah being the short form of Yahweh. Many popular names in the Bible also have the shortened form of Yahweh's name in them. For example, Jeremiah, meaning Yah will rise. Isaiah, Yah has saved. Zechariah, Yah has remembered. The references to the importance of the name Yahweh are all through the Bible, even the Ten Commandments. The third commandment, properly translated, says, Thou shalt not take the name of Yahweh thy Elohim in vain. For Yahweh will not hold him guiltless that takes his name in vain. Vain in Hebrew is shah and means making useless. Isn't it interesting that the true saints spoken of in the prophetic passage of Revelation 3.8 did not neglect his name Yahweh? I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. We have an important free booklet we are offering to you today called, But I Speak English. This booklet answers common questions many have when confronted with the name Yahweh and the decision to begin using it. To receive your copy, call 573-896-9248 or write P.O. Box 463, Holt Summit, Missouri 65043. You can request and read this booklet and many more online at YRM.org. You may be shocked to learn that nowhere did the Apostle Paul, the other supposed champion of Christianity, nowhere did he worship on Sunday. Nowhere in the scriptures do we read that he kept Easter, that he adored a cross, held communion, observed Palm Sunday, or replaced obedience with faith alone. There is not one verse where he advocated any of these modern popular teachings or practices. Now this should make everyone wonder what is going on. This idea of grace through faith alone is a teaching entirely missing in the New Testament. It's in the writings of Martin Luther, however, who came along 1500 years later. So what were the people practicing between that time and Martin Luther, you may wonder? Well, that's what we're talking about today. The only place where the words faith alone exist in the Bible is in James chapter 2, verse 17. Even so, faith, if it has not works, is dead, being alone. Sure, the just live by faith. That, that's in the Word. We, we, we find that very plain. But what makes them just? There's only one way to be just, and that is to be obedient to the Father Yahweh's standards. What did the New Testament writers teach then? They taught the covenant made with Israel and our opportunity today to join in that covenant through obedience to the same promises given to Abraham. Their teachings never discussed bringing in of a new faith to the world, complete with a whole new paradigm of love and grace as the foundation of everything, with obedience just thrown out the window. For some viewers, this is a mighty big pill to swallow, considering centuries of misguided traditional teachings and thinking that almost every Bible believer grew up with today. It's time to look outside the box and discover what has been hidden there in plain sight for thousands of years. It's time to return to the roots of New Testament worship. A man named Jude, Yahshua the Messiah's half-brother, writes, by the way, notice his actual name is Judah. In Jude chapter 1 and verse 3 he writes, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Now that faith, which is conviction of the truth, that was given is not a reference to what the apostles taught. Look at the succeeding verses. Jude says, remember how Yahweh saved the Israelites from Egypt. 
That is the faith Jude is talking about. The original covenant truths given when Yahweh presented them to Israel at Sinai. So if Christianity did not begin with the historical Messiah, did it perhaps begin with the disciples and apostles witnessing and believing in his resurrection? Maybe it all started with them on the occasion of Easter or perhaps Pentecost seven weeks later. When the apostle Peter finally came to the irrefutable conclusion that Yahweh had raised Yahshua from the dead, did he suddenly say to himself, so from now on I am no longer a Jew, but now I am a Christian? No, he did not. This messianic group existed in Jerusalem at the beginning of the Jewish-Roman War as one Jewish group among others. That it was perceived as a Jewish group also by other Jews is revealed by the Jewish historian Flavius Josephus. If we look at the, the man Stephen, you know in the church Stephen is considered to be the first Christian martyr. However, was Stephen even a Christian? He belonged to what was called the Hellenists, that is, Greek-speaking Jews in Jerusalem who believed in Yahshua the Messiah. Luke presents this in Acts chapter 7 and 8 as an inner Jewish quarrel. Jews are not turning against Christians, but against other Jews, whose specific characteristic was that they considered Yahshua to be the Messiah, from which they drew consequences that provoked vehement confrontations. This killing of Stephen was nothing less than mob mania, but it had nothing to do with a Christian fight. Was the Apostle Paul out attacking Christians before he was knocked down on the Damascus Road? Not on your life. He was carrying out intra-synagogal punishment on other Jews. When he was called to the truth himself, he didn't think, okay, now I am no longer a Jew but a Christian. Paul never uses this designation anywhere. Of course, he experienced a change, but that was a change from a pharisaically defined Jew to a Messiah-believing Jew. Paul never gave up his Jewishness, at least not in his own consciousness. If other teachers emphasize their Jewishness, he can do likewise. He says, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 22. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin, he writes in Romans chapter 11, verse 1. He says of himself and Simon Peter, we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, in Galatians 2, 15. When entering a new city, Paul always goes to the synagogue first. Have you noticed that? The Jewish synagogue. The Messiah-believing people coming from Cyprus and Cyrene to, to Antioch will first have gone to the synagogue. They will also have appeared there on the Sabbath and hear the law. With this background, we come now to the crux of the issue. How different should Christianity be from Judaism? What changed? Why did it change? And who changed it? Getting right to the answer to these questions opens up a whole range of new understanding. Most apologists will answer that it was the Messiah who changed everything. He changed worship to the first day of the week. He transformed the Passover into Easter. He abolished the sacrificial system. He eliminated the law and the need to obey. He invented Christianity, they say, which by necessity must throw out the Old Testament. In fact, he did none of that. For one thing, he commanded us not to ignore, but to go to the Old Testament. In John chapter 5, verse 39, he said, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Now, these scriptures he's talking about were the Old Testament passages and verses, the only Bible in existence at that time. Yahshua the Messiah, your Savior and mine, was a Torah-observing Jew. If you want to know more about him, write for our free booklet, The True Messiah. Here you'll find... Fascinating information about the real Messiah that you were never told about. Who he was, when he actually was born, when, uh, what, his, what his name actually was, and what his father name was. What he looked like here on earth. Whether he had brothers and sisters. Why he came, what he did. When he died, why he died. All of these are answered in the 
True Messiah booklet, which is free of charge, and you can write for it simply by going to our website and getting the information or the information that you'll see here on the screen. We'll be right back in just a minute. Here's another tidbit of Bible truth that you may have not considered seriously before. In Matthew 5, 17, our Savior says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. Now, this is what people mostly think when they think of the New Testament. No more law. And he said, I did not come to destroy the law or the prophets or the Old Testament teachings. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. He goes on, he says, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. And then our Savior proceeds to magnify the law. Make it even more binding. Throughout his ministry, the Messiah introduced spiritual applications that render the law even more critical and binding. He taught the spiritual dimension of the law as well as the physical. He revealed that the guiding principles he lived by must also be in our hearts. If it was right for him, it is surely right and proper for us. Far from abolishing our need to obey, he magnified what his Father had commanded, placing it on an even higher level. In other words, he raised the bar. He said in Matthew 5 and elsewhere that if you just think bad thoughts, you're breaking the law and therefore sinning. You don't even have to go out and actually do it, but just Getting your mind involved in it and thinking about doing it is just as bad. This is one way he taught the deeper spiritual dimensions of the law of his father Yahweh. When you think about it, the law is simply just the nature of the Heavenly Father, his character, his standards by which he lives by. Wouldn't he give these also to his people? Would he want them to be lawless while he is a law keeper, while he is observant of law? Doesn't make any sense, does it? Obviously, he's going to teach his people the same thing he believes, just like a father teaches his son, the same standards that the father lives by. The observance of biblical law as the will of the father is a central theme in the teachings of Yahshua the Messiah and his followers. When he was asked, how can one find everlasting life? He immediately enumerated five of the Ten Commandments and admonished the, admonished the individual to keep the commandments. Many dwell on what they believe Paul did away with. They best be focused on what their Savior said was necessary for salvation. When Yahshua the Messiah explained how to love him and be loved of the Father, he said in John 15, 10, keep my commandments. He told the woman who issued a blessing about his mother in Luke chapter 11 that more blessed than even the family are those who hear the word and keep it. In verse 50, he said, 
For whosoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. But we know what the Father's will is. It's all over the Old Testament. Yahshua affirmed that and, and made it just as important as his father did. His problem with the religious leaders was in adding their own laws, not their keeping of Yahweh's laws. They added all sorts of different things. Sacrifices weren't original. They were added later. In Mark chapter 7, verse 8, For laying aside the commandment of Elohim, you hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other things such as you do. With Christian being the term used by Gentiles to describe believers, we get the following terms within the first 15 years of the impalement of Yahshua the Messiah. You get the word Nazarenes, which was a term used by Jewish enemies for the converted believers. Christian was the term used by Greek Gentiles for the early assembly. Followers of the way was the term used sometimes by the assembly for itself. Church is a pagan term, believe it or not, from the Greek goddess Circe, morphed into the Dutch Kirke and the German Kirk. That's why we don't use it of ourselves. We call ourselves a ministry. You can call the group of believers an assembly. You know, it's important to note that Yahshua did not give any such name to his group. He refers to them as disciples and believers and followers and friends and students, but does not give them an umbrella group name. The earliest body of believers were named by others as the Nazarenes or the followers of the one from Nazareth. Yahshua, the Messiah, is frequently called the Nazarenes, such as in Matthew chapter 2, verse 23. In about the year 50, there developed a crisis that Paul had to deal with by consulting the elders at Jerusalem. It developed from those who thought that new converts had to convert to Judaism and adopt Jewish customs before they could enter the New Covenant, the New Testament. Why? Obviously because of the Jewish roots of the early assembly. It wouldn't be an issue if there weren't Jewish roots in that early assembly. The early believers were all Jews. Fascinating and true. Well, we hope you enjoyed today's program. Stay tuned for another Discover the Truth in future broadcasts. May Yahweh bless you. To request any of our free booklets, DVDs, or CDs, write to Discover the Truth, P.O. Box 463, Holt Summit, Missouri, 65043, or call 573-896-9248. We urge you to visit our extensive ministry website at yrm.org. There you will find articles and booklets to read or request, archive sermons, music, live streaming worship services, and much more. For information about this program or to watch past programs, visit discoverthetruth.tv. Thank you for letting us into your home today. We hope you tune in next week as we bring you another exciting episode of Discover the Truth.